should uh, start the afternoon session with Marcus Kner, who will tell us about contextualism, relativism, and thin content. First of all, thanks so much for having me here, in particular to uh, Kepa and uh, his organizing team. Thank you very much. It's a delight. <coughs> so, can you hear me if I stand like if I speak like this? No, um, this is this is bad for one's back. No. Um, no, no. Like I'll I'll, I'll make do like this. Um, I'm going to jump right in and then give you the um, overview of the talk in a bit. Actually, this is better. So um, there's this phenomenon that got a lot of attention recently called faultless disagreement. And um, it more or less goes like this. So we'll take the following exchange. John says, Caravaggio's supper at Emaus is beautiful. And Mary responds, I disagree. It isn't beautiful. Then, or so at least it seems, there is genuine, genuine disagreement, as explicitly stated. Now, Mary says, I disagree. And there seems to be faultlessness, because in contrast to ordinary disagreement, neither speaker seems to be holding a mistaken belief. Now, there's various responses to this phenomenon. Indexi indexical contextualism, for instance, says, well, you know, it's an illusion. What we have to do is we have to posit a judge variable for beautiful so that the supper is beautiful for X, for instance, for the speaker or group or the experts or something, such that the content expressed varies with context, whereas the truth value rests constant. Hence, there's faultlessness, but no disagreement, because to a certain extent, people are just talking past each other. So in a standard Kaplanian framework, this looks like this. There's a judge variable attached to the expression beautiful in the character of the sentence, which draws a judge value from the context, and thus gives us a speaker relative content. Here the speaker is John. And here the speakers marry, in which case we have a different content expressed. Now, relativism <coughs> says the content is, in fact, judge neutral. This means the judge is a parameter in the circumstance of evaluation, but it isn't part of the um, proposition expressed, if you want. So the content is constant across contexts in virtue of which we can have disagreement, whereas the truth value varies with the judge parameter, sort of subjective truth, in virtue of which we have faultlessness. So in our little framework, we see that the character and the content do not have a, jud uh, a, a judge variable, whereas in the circumstances besides worlds, times, and possibly other stuff, you have a judge, so the truth value is relative to said judge. This is sort of the simple version of the picture. McFarlane has introduced a more complex one. In which the circumstances or the parameters of the circumstance are not exclusively drawn from the context of utterance, but as highlighted by the red circle, also from a context of assessment. So in this case, for example, the world and the time might come from the context of utterance, whereas the context of assessment provides a judge variable. Depending on who assesses the utterance, the truth value might change. So roughly, there are two types of relativism for what matters here, simple and complex. So if the first picture is probably in tune with Kölbel and Lazerson, the second one with McFarlane and, uh, and his followers. The important feature is the radical rift 
between thin content on the one hand and circumstance on the other. So that's this thin little dotted line here indicated by a more remarkable red line. And the idea is <clears throat> that the characteristic trait of relativism, at least for this talk, is this. The invariable content of an utterance or thought, the proposition or quasi-proposition, if you want, is the parameter neutral or thin content. This picture is very different from one in which the proposition is conceived as jointly determined by thin content and circumstance, such as this. In such a case, the object of thought and language is the complete content, or as Francois Ricanati calls it, the Austinian proposition, rather than the thin content alone or the lecton. This picture, of course, is not a relativist one. We can follow McFarlane in calling it non-indexical non contextualism. It's just sort of a technical variant of the hidden, hidden variable picture. And um, as uh, Isidora Stojanovic has shown, um, it's truth conditionally equivalent with it. So the target of the talk <clears throat> is this notion of thin content. The notion of thin content as a constituent, I will argue, of ordinary thought and language, i.e. as the content we disagree with, which we report others as having, which we potentially retract if we change our minds, does not make a lot of sense. Well, maybe it makes sense as a technical notion, but it's certainly not part of ordinary linguistic behavior and probably not the object of ordinary propositional attitudes. So I'll try and discuss four problems for the thin content picture. Firstly, the incompleteness worry. Secondly, complex binding. And then thirdly, and this is some new experimental data, thin content use in ordinary language. And fourth, um, relativist truth assessment and retraction. That's also new experimental data. So as regards incompleteness, I'm in very good company. <clears throat> I won't read all these quotes, but there's some, um, this was already remarked by uh, Frege that it doesn't make all too much sense. McFarlane is very aware of the um, very, Capellan and Hawthorne have um, mentioned it explicitly, so has um, Friederike Moltmann. Here's a little sampler of, um, of what they say. In his unpublished manuscript Logic, Frege says something like, asserting a thin content, one would not be asserting anything at all, and there would be no contradiction between the opinions of different people. McFarlane, for instance, says, he sometimes calls it the intention problem, at which circumstances of evaluation is the proposition that Clara is just plain tall true? Capellan and Hawthorne say, there is something of a strain in accepting that each such, such thin semantic value cuts the space of possibility into the worlds where it is true and the worlds where it is not, grounded in felt uneasiness at answering very simple questions about what it would take for thin semantic value to be true. So I basically did this whole incompleteness thing. I'm throwing language and, uh, and thought together here, and I think they can't really be the object, objects of either propositional attitudes or um, the uttered contents. So very simply put, the very is this. Thin contents are too indeterminate to serve as contents of propositional attitudes or utterances. Take the examples, it's raining, or Skia bin second is beautiful, if I am in the dark as to the location or judge parameter, I cannot make sense of your utterance or belief. So the structure of the argument is this. <clears throat> Relativism invokes thin contents. Thin contents are completely underdetermined entities that cannot serve as objects of propositional attitudes or utterance contents. Hence, relativism is false. Now, so far, this is, um, this is all old news. Um, the really astonishing thing is how McFarlane, so there's very little, very few replies to this problem. Um, the only one I'm aware of is, um, is by McFarlane, and this is his response. 
Um, it's a condition I'll call modal anxiety. So he, he proposes this, um, this condition of modal anxiety and it is intended to block the argument from incomplete contents against relativism. What he says is, the incompleteness objection proves too much. Even if we put location, time, and so forth into the content of Sam's weather belief, then it is still not determined whether the accuracy of his belief depends on the temperature in Paris in world W1 or in world W2. However, bringing the world of the context into the content of Sam's thought, and this is the um, anxiety, would make this content a necessary truth about this possible world rather than a contingent truth about the weather in Paris. So what McFarlane suggests is that an actualized version of the content P of a thought or utterance, if true, makes P necessary. Let P stand for contingent proposition, A for the actuality op operator, N for an, maybe if you want, as yet underdefined necessity operator, then McFarlane's worry is captured by the fact that contingent truths are turned into necessary actual truths in virtue of said actualization. Now this is um, certainly true in some sense of necessarily, but it's false in another sense. So if we distinguish following Evans and um, Davies and Humberstone and many, many after them, if we distinguish superficial necessity from deep necessity, I think we can get rid of modal anxiety. Superficial necessity requires that if P is true at, at the actual world, actually P is true at all worlds, W. Why? Because it must always be evaluated with respect to the actual world. As Evan says, this notion of necessity is internal to semantic theory, and as Davies, explains it is a property of modal sentences rather than a modal property of sentences. Deep necessity, on the other hand, is defined thus. P is true at all worlds W when W is considered as actual. So if P is deeply contingent, there will exist some state of affairs of which we can say both that had it not existed, the statement would not have been true, and that it might not have existed. As I said before, this is a modal property of sentences rather than a property of modal sentences. So yes, McFarlane is right that if P, then necessarily actually P is true if N stands for superficially necessary, but it is not true if N stands for deeply necessary. Now, if we look at the precise wording of the objection again, what does this mean? So McFarlane says, bringing the world of the context into the content of Sam's thought would make this content a necessary truth about this possible world. The important thing is rather than a contingent truth about the weather in Paris. Now the weather in Paris is precisely the kind of state of affairs of which we can say both that had it not existed, the statement would not have been true and that it might not have existed that means that kind of thing which defines deep contingency. So Sam's belief, if true, is both a superficially necessary truth about this possible world and a deeply contingent truth about the weather in Paris. So it's not a rather than affair, but a both and affair. And of course, superficial necessity is entirely consistent with deep contingency. But it is deep necessity that would be worrisome since deep necessity corresponds to our intuitive notion of necessity. So I think um, modal anxiety is actually uh, 
rather hypochondriacal delusion. You can also see that from the fact that concrete instances cause no distress. So if you're familiar with this um, wonderful film by Jim Jarmusch called Down by Law, this is some um, scene where Roberto Benini says, this is a sad and beautiful world, and it does not make us leave the cinema and shout modal nonsense. The proposition is superficially necessary but deeply contingent. Had a sad and ugly world been actual, it would have been false. So no problem. And finally, even if anxiety were warranted, it have little relevance, no? So um, if you look at the argument again, the general problem with McFarlane's response is that it does not fix the problem. It just raises another problem, or as I have argued, a pseudo-problem. Now, for those who are still feeling some sort of modal anxiety in the face of superficial necessity, they should maybe much rather turn to their modal logic. Superficial necessity is a notion of necess necessity internal to the logical system. It arises due to a particular way of defining the actuality operator. So it raises another problem, but it does not fix the incompleteness problem. Now, given that this is sort of the only proper response to the incompleteness problem, and the incompleteness problem is pretty much everywhere, um, we're a little surprised by the um, nonchalance of the, of, the, of the relativists, I think. So the, the prelim, well, the conclusion for the section is that to pro propose a plausible semantic theory, the relativist should give a plausible reply to the incompleteness worry. Modal anxiety is not such a reply. Okay. <clears throat> Second argument, um, complex binding. So again, I'm, I'm taking other people's arguments and then um, sort of try to add to them a bit. So the indexical contextualists, when it comes to, to terms like beautiful or rain or whatnot, wants, wants to judge variables. These are generally hard to spot. However, they can be bound by quantifiers. And if, and this is sort of like a big premise, which I'm not going to defend, embedding does not change syntactic form, or if there is some sort of semantic innocence, um, binding might be proved for variable existence. The standard um, example is um, the one um, originally provided by Stanley. Um, wherever John goes, it rains, can be interpreted as whichever place P, John goes to, it rains at P. Now again, given semantic innocence, this interpretation is evidence in favor of a location variable pertaining to rain. That is what is bound by the quantifier phrase. Now then one can sort of draw up um, a similar example as regards, you know, predicates of personal taste, for instance, as regards fun. Every man rode some ride that was fun. The most natural interpretation, every man X rode some ride fun for X, seems to require the postulation of a judge variable for fun, such that it binds into each of the values quantified over individually. Now, of course, indexical contextualism can cope without problems with individual binding. Relativism might seem to have problems because it conceives of the judge as a parameter rather than a syntactic variable. And there standardly is a single judge parameter rather than a flexible one that matches up each man with his ride. And now this is some rather, rather interesting argument by Leserson who responds to the anti-relativist binding argument, um, which of course he has to, um, but, th but this is much more interesting, he actually turns binding into a pro-relativism argument. So he says, instead of object language binding, what occurs is meta-language binding of the judge parameter. This, this procedure he calls index binding, 
In such index pointing, we are employing a single systematic parameter relative to which all denotations are assigned. And if an operator manipulates this parameter, it will do so for all expressions in its scope. I'll spare you the, de the, the, the technical details, but um, and, and I'll just grant lasers on that this makes sense. Um, which means that index binding can do the same as parameter binding, no, the same as variable binding. The judge parameter, according to whom the ride was fun, varies with the values introduced by the quantifier every man. Here comes the interesting bit. Take the following sentence. Every man gave some woman a fun ride and a tasty dish. Like there's, I don't know how many interpretations of this sentence, but, um, but here are sort of four. It could mean all rides are fun and all dishes are tasty to the speaker. It could also mean each man finds his ride fun and his, or the, and his dish tasty, meaning the, the dish he gave to the woman. Um, or we could have the same interpretation for the receiving end. Each woman finds the, the, the right fun which she received and the dish um, which she received tasty. But it gets complicated once we sort of assume multiple perspectives, which is done in interpretation 4D. So the rides are fun for each man, or each man thinks that the ride he gave was fun. And all the and each woman thinks that the dish she was given was fun, but that wasn't necessarily the opinion of each man. Now, contextualism can, of course, cope with this very easily, like all we're interested really in is, is 4D at the moment, um, because what they do is they posit two variables now. They posit one for tasty and one for fun, and they can, of course, take different values. Now, relativism cannot really make sense of reading 4D because they have a single judge parameter which requires relativization of both rights and fun to the said judge. I'll say again what, what um, Lazerson says about index binding. He says, we are employing a single systematic parameter relative to which all denotations are, are assigned. And if an operator manip manipulates this parameter, it will do so for all expressions in its scope. The intuition of this is, in a relativist theory, in order to assess a sentence for truth or falsity, one must adopt a stance, that is, truth assessment is always done from a or one particular perspective. Operators in the sentence may shift the perspective from which truth assessment is to be done or quantify over such perspectives, and when they do so, the relevant perspective must be adopted for the entire scope of the operator. So relativism, according to Lazarson, cannot account for reading 4D, in which the rides are fun for the men and the dishes for the women. But that is not a problem, says, says Lazarson, since the sentence cannot mean that each man gave some woman a ride that was fun for him and a dish that was tasty for her. This he takes to show that predicates of personal taste cannot have arguments as proposed by indexical contextualists. So this is a really interesting argument, I think, because what Lazerson wants to show is that the limited expressive power of index binding fits natural language, like a glove. This, in turn, he takes to show that variable binding, which gives rise to superfluous um, readings, cannot be right. Now, as regards the latter, um, it's a little extreme as a conclusion. Of course, the greater expressive power of variable binding certainly does not speak against it. And this is sort of the new argument now. The extra power is actually needed. Consider the following examples. 
Every dad would take some child to the fairground to try out a fun new ride and get a delicious local brew. So I think it's very obvious in the sentence that delicious, that, that the brews are delici delicious for the, for the dad and the rides are fun for the kids. Or on Halloween, every kid would either play an idiotic trick on some adult or get a delicious treat. Here again, I think um, we have a relatively clear case. Um, if you're not convinced, take things like, you know, every parent had brought a child to the resort, the moonlight tango dancing was romantic, and the splash pool a lot of fun. You know, or if you want to be, if you like, want to play on gender stereotypes, every guy brought his girlfriend to the soccer final, the game was exciting, and the players were gorgeous. Um, <laughs> or uh, like a uh, riffing of McFarlane maybe, um, who always talks about fish sticks. Every parent had brought a child to the restaurant, the wine was delicious and so were the fish sticks. Okay, so I think it's just a very clear case that we need two different variables. Um, and that is precisely what, I mean, what relativism is gonna have trouble with. And so what seemed like an advantage for relativism because it so beautifully captures the theoretical perspective in the, in the semantic framework um, does actually pose a big problem. So, <clears throat> conclusion of this little part is um, that given semantic innocence, multiple judge examples constitute evidence against the limited resources of relativist index binding. Thin content used in ordinary language. Um, so it's, I think it's somewhat surprising that people are like basically basing the basing the entire literature on um, sort of their very restricted intuitions um, regarding fault, faultless disagreement and the like. Um, but you can just go out and actually ask people what they think. Um, now, one way to do this is. Um, to go back to the original context war between contextualism and semantic minimalism and say, well, let's pool intuitions of ordinary people concerning parameter dependent, you know, or variable dependent versus parameter independent utterances or like variable independent ones. So dance is location independent, rain is location dependent, you know, you ask people, imagine the following dialogue taking place. This structure is, of course, um, familiar from uh, François Ricanati's writings on this topic. Um, Mary went dancing last night. Chris responds, where? Frank says, I have no idea. And you ask people, how does this dialogue sound to you? Perfectly normal versus strange. And you do the same thing for rain. You know, Frank says, it's raining. Chris says, where? Frank says, I have no idea. How does it sound to you? You do, you know, you did for ready and for tall and what else? Um, now, the results are relatively um, decisive. Now, um, so most people find the the dance dialogue perfectly normal versus rain, tall and ready, um, relatively strange. Now, completely strange in the case of rain. Um, and this doesn't only hold for English speakers. This was, the, this was an on, online survey done with English speakers. Um, it also holds when you do like a paper survey, for instance, with uh, French speakers. Um, what does this mean? It means thin content does not seem to be a type of content which is part of ordinary language use. Hence, disagreement in content should not be understood as disagreement in thin content and thin content explanations of faultless disagreement are inadequate. Now the first objection um, is gonna be, well, faultless disagreement shows that thin contents are part of ordinary speech, you know? Well, I mean, why, no? Because I've, I've just been testing things that don't necessarily give rise to faultless disagreement with the exception of maybe tall. The response is, well, 
In that case, we would explain the existence of faultless disagreement with thin contents and the existence of thin contents with faultless disagreement. Yeah, which is somewhat circular. So, in order to explain faultless disagreement, we need an independent argument for the ordinary use of thin contents. And given the evidence, we also need an explanation why thin contents regarding taste, aesthetics, modality, and so forth are different from standard thin contents regarding the location of rain, ready, and so forth, because these, the latter, the rain, ready, and so forth contents, are not used in a thin way in ordinary speech. So then the question is, well, why did you not test tasty, beautiful, and might? You know? um, and the response is that I think that standard faultless disagreement expressions such as beautiful and so forth are polysemous. They have an objective and a subjective use. Faultless disagreement arises because we sort of mix up these uses. So it's an illusion, really. Um, and the more concrete response is then, the above experiment will not work with beautiful or good or something because many people will automatically disambiguate to the objective views. So it will not sound strange to them if I just say, well, it's beautiful without specifying a judge. However, we can test epistemic models and knowledge descriptions because I don't think they are polysemous. So um, take the following scenario. <clears throat> You are having dinner with some friends in New York, discussing whether Stephanie is currently in France or not. Nobody knows for sure. Frank says, Stephanie might be in France right now. Just then you receive a text message from Stephanie which says that she is in New York. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following claim? What Frank said was false. So relativism would say, well, the claim Stephanie might be in France right now can be um, evaluated, um, for example, at Frank's epistemic um, situation or perspective. And given Frank's epistemic situation, the claim is true. No? There is just no information to the contrary at the, at the moment. Whereas you evaluate S at a different circumstance, which draws the world and the time, of course, from the context of utterance, but the epistemic situation from your context of assessment, which has been, you know, sort of, um, which has advanced, now you just received a text message. So given your epistemic situation, S would be false. So relativism, especially like McFarlane relativism, that is, um, would pred predict that people say, what Frank said is false, and they would also, it would also predict that Frank is deemed to be under an oblig obligation to retract his statement. So the way we set up this, um, well, the way I set up this experiment um, is I took um, a cue from McFarlane who says, well, you know, you can contrast your intuitions as regards might with your intuitions as regards like a non-modal -modal formulation where um, you know, Frank says, for all I know, and thereby explicitly in the content stipulates his epistemic situation, okay? And the predictions, of course, are of McFarlane, are that in the case where you know, Frank says, Stephanie might be in France, people would say, you know, that is false because they've got new information or they just received a text message. Whereas in the case where Frank says, for all I know, I mean, he's hedging his bets, you know? um, he says, for all I know, um, Stephanie is in, um, in uh, France, McFarlane would predict that people do not think it is false. You know? So on a Likert scale from one to seven, where one means completely disagree and seven means completely agree, this pattern is what McFarlane predicts, you know? So seven basically stands for the claim is false, and one stands for the claim is not false at all. The actual results are, are completely different. Um, so um, 
What you see here is the difference between the modal and the non-modal -formula non formulation is not significant. Um, so this kind of predicted difference by, where? by, by McFarlane is, um, you know, is false. But at the same time, we're, you know, does this really speak strongly against um, assessment sensitivity? Maybe not. But you can go on, you know, you can ask people, what do you actually deem false? You know, because there's two sources of falsity, you know, like you can say, well, the modal claim, it might be that Stephanie is in France is false, you know, or else the embedded claim, it might be that Stephanie is in France is false. And all this, since these people, you know, aren't necessarily experts in linguistics or analytic philosophy, they might just sort of tick the wrong box. So all the ones who have ticked that the claim is false, you can ask, well, you know, what exactly did you mean? So you give them the following options. It is false to say that Stephanie is in France, but it was not false for Frank to say that she might be in France, or else, and this would be the whole claim, Frank's claim that Stephanie might be in France was false. Okay. Now, here the results are really decisive. Okay. So people do not think that Frank's claim that Stephanie might be in France was false. They think it's true, even though their epistemic situation has changed. Okay. Like this is, this is just the results of the follow-up but we can aggregate them with the previous results, in which case things look like that. You know, so all the people who um, said, um, you know, basically chose one, two, three in the Likert scale um, in the first round, are asked again what they mean by false. And this is something, um, something you get. So people think the epistemic model claim is, um, is true, so they assume Frank's epistemic position, um, and it's relatively similar to um, the non-model formulation in which you have for all I know, which sort of explicitly stipulates the epistemic situation of Frank. So just to, <laughs> to make it really obvious, um, the first thing are the actual results, the second thing are McFarlane's predictions, okay? It could not be more wrong. Um, it's just like, it's exactly inverted. Now you might say, okay, what does a single experiment prove? Um, well, I varied it a little, you know, took the same scenario and said, it just gave people a lot of responses. I said, well, which of the following options captures best what you think about Frank's statement? And they could say what Frank said is false, what Frank said was false, what Frank said is not false, or was not false. Okay, so they've got a lot of options here and we sort of um, give them a bit of choice and we, we're not pushing them anyway, you know. Um, and still, you know, 51 native English speakers say, the might be formulation is not false, you know. And the dominant responses for both the modal and the non-modal version was that neither was false, okay. You can, you can do the same thing with French speakers, okay. And in this case, for example, I didn't use a Likert scale, I just said, well, is it false or is it not false? Do you think what Frank said was false, is what I asked. I didn't give them any options, you know, or not as many as in the, the experiment before. Again, you know, the dominant answer is it was not false, okay? In the modal case, you've got 60% saying what Frank said was not false, even though here, sort of the Actually, in the non-modal case, 60% said, so in the for all I know formulation, 60% said, well, what Frank said what was not false. And in the modal version, um, it, is, it is even more, it's 80%. So this is interesting. No? The epistemic situation of the speaker and no one else seems more salient in the modal formulation 
the unarticulated epistemic constituent that seems to work at least as well as the explicit one in the for all I know formulation. So you're probably familiar with these like eavesdropping cases, which I'm skipping now because otherwise I'd run over time. I'll just show you. So basically the deal is same, same responses. Okay, McFarlane is just on the wrong track. Um, last little experiment. So McFarlane, for instance, as, as, as well as other relativists say, well, knowledge descriptions are assessment sensitive also. What does this mean? Well, take the following little scenario. John has just parked his car in the driveway of his house. Shortly thereafter, his wife Sally asks him in the living room, do you know where your car is? And John says, I know it's in the driveway. And Sally then says, are you sure it hasn't been stolen in the meantime? And, um, and raises, you know, sort of the demands of the uh, standards of epistemic precision a little, or like the epistemic standards in general, not necessarily precision. And McFarlane says, well, in this scenario, John would say that he didn't know, you know, since S is now evaluated at a world drawn from the context of utterance, a time drawn from the context of utterance, and an epistemic standard drawn from the context of assessment, you know? So it's a different epistemic standard from the one which had been provided by the context of utterance, where his original, where his utterance actually took place. No? So McFarlane's prediction is, John would retract his statement S because from his current context of assessment in which the epistemic standards have been raised, it is false. Now, I asked people, I gave people that scenario, you know, and um, <laughs> asked them, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? What John said was false. And they could sort of agree and disagree on a seven point Likert scale again, where one meant uh, completely disagree and seven meant um, completely agree. And, I, and then afterwards I asked them, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? It would be appropriate for John to take back what he said. In fact, these were two independent samples. Um, so McFarlane's predictions are some, something like this. Now he would say, well, okay, six or seven means, yes, it was false, you know, and it also means, yes, you have to retract the claim, whereas one or two would mean, no, you know, it wasn't false, and no, you don't have to retract. And again, the actual results are very different. People do not think that John's claim that his car was in the driveway is false or was false. They do not think either that he should retract his claim. This suggests that they relativize the content not to the more stringent epistemic standard, which has been brought into the game by Sally or by his wife. Instead, they relativize the content to the speaker's or John's original epistemic standard. This means claims involving epistemic models are not assessment sensitive and they do not give rise to retraction intuitions. I haven't really shown that, but in the bond scenario, I do show that. What I have shown just now is that claims of knowledge are not assessment sensitive and do not give rise to retraction intuitions. So relativism seems to work with fundamentally flawed assumptions, um, I think. Thank you. Um, so for complicated technical reasons having to do with uh, abruptly changing terms and conditions for the, the software that Marcus used for the experiments, uh, Marcus was prevented from getting his paper uh, to Gemma in time for her to write comments. So that means we can move directly to the Q&A and we have a bit more time for that. So, uh, questions? Done.
Yeah, thanks. So I was wondering whether the the results of your experiments are somehow influenced by the fact that you're testing the sentences in the present in in the in the past because all the samples you gave were what John said was false or uh, and so <laughs> probably would have made much sense uh, sorry more sense or would have made sense to test whether what's the speaker's reactions to what John said is false because if you use false that just if you use was that just means that they just go and evaluate uh, the sentence at the standards there but it doesn't that doesn't show anything against relativism, I take it, because indeed that's the thing to do when you ask it if it was false, then the relativist does predict that it should have been the standard there. Whereas if you ask if it's false now, uh, so that, that might be a, so is, you think this is an acceptable answer from the, answer from the relativist? So, um, so I think, I mean, the was formulation is precisely what McFarlane has in mind. That's what he says ex explicitly. Now, the deal is um, that my current context of assessment even um, sort of makes the claim, which I made earlier, false um, relative to the context of utterance and the context of assessment, which jointly determine the circumstances of evaluation. However, I have tested the, um, the present tense thing, and it is, you know, there is no statistical difference. Um, I sort of took it out here because, because I <laughs> was fearing to overwhelm you with data, but I actually have it with me, so if you're interested, you, you can come and look at it. Um, or if other people are interested, I, I can even pull it up. Um, more questions? Sorry, I, I'm not sure this connects to the whole dialectic of, of what you're doing, but it occurred to me that in the um, in the case of uh, uh, Steph might be in France versus, uh, for all I know, Steph is in France, where people seem to say that the might be one is true more. And the one second, if you give me a second oh, sure. so, I, so I can focus, I'll, I'll pull up the case, okay? Um. This one, no? Yeah. So, so was the result? I, I, maybe I just re remembered it, but were you saying that the result was that people thought the might be one had a better than the for all I know one? Or was it? So. Yeah. So they thought that was more true. Or, yeah. People yeah, I think in general. So I think this. <laughs> so a non relativist would say, well, the for all I know and the might would probably be the same. Mm -hmm. Roughly now, and yeah. McFarlane would say the opposite. Now he would say, "Well, might or the epistemic modal formulation is deemed false, mm -hmm. whereas if you sort of explicitly flag right. your epistemic situation in the content of the utterance, well, then you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, no one can mess with you, so to say. Right. You know, so the um, for all I know results are as predicted. And the nice thing, if you're an anti-relativist, is that the might." is very similar to the for all I know, the non-modal formulation. What is sort of a little unexpected is that it's, it's even more extreme. Yeah, you know? so that, that's what I wanted to, uh, not, it's, it's sort of a question, I guess, or a suggestion, that it strikes me that one explanation for the difference might be that uh, the might could also suggest a, a kind of counterfactual or a general possibility reading. So. Uh, you know, Steph might be in France. That's true in the sense that she could have been. I mean, it's not, it's not impossible. Whereas Steph is in France, that's just false in the scenario that you give. And so it's a metaphysical might rather than an epistemic might. Well, mm. people are, maybe that's contributing. Cause this difference looks, it looks significant. I don't know if it is, but that would be, the, the, the might is actually hedging the claim in some ways more than for all I know, which is still sticking with a straight out indicative claim, so. Yeah, and that's very interesting. So it, the challenge here is to conceive of an experiment where sort of the metaphysical reading is more dominant and another one in which the epistemic reading is more dominant because we might have both in 
could be in this one bar. In this yeah. Thank you. Um, nice talk. C could you bring up the slide wi with these sentences five and six? Yeah. Because I, I sort of remember five, but not six. Ah, really. damn it! Excuse me. Oh. You, can you tell me what they were about? Uh, the um, distribution of. Uh, predicates of personal tastes over different individuals. Yeah. Uh, as against loss or Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so you use these to to uh, argue against um, uh, loss or son and say that it's perfectly possible to have uh, readings where the uh, uh, where the con contextualism gets it right and the uh, um, the uh, predicate is related to different s subjects now i i think um, there is a problem with both of these sentences um as regards five um there is uh an implicit sameness of subject uh to the true both uh conjuncts of the verb phrase so what this means is that same subject tries out the, the fun new ride and gets a delicious local brew it's hard to get a reading wh where it there's two different subjects, one that tries out the fun new ride and another that, get, that gets a delicious local brew. So um, if it has to be the same, I mean, it, it can't be true if it's the child. It can't be true if it's the father. Uh, the only way out for you would be to say that it's the pair of them that is the subject in both cases. And, and the predicate of personal taste selects one member of the pair differently, uh, that would be a, a tricky, complicated reading. So I, it strikes me uh, as a bit infelicitous. Um, can I, can I, before you continue, can I just try and reformulate what I understood? So you think there is not a single subject, no? There's sort of... Um, the kids like the fun rides, no, or the kid, um, and the dads like the the brews, no. But that is exactly what I'm saying. That this is the problem for relativists because a contextualist he will just posit two different variables, you know. The relativist, as we have seen, Lazerson says, well, you know, the relativist is binding the parameter in the circumstance in some kind of awkward move, but since I'm not technically competent enough to criticize it, I have to take it on. But he says explicitly that any kind of judge thing has to relate to the single parameter in the circumstance. So it's uh, what you just said, you know, is indeed precisely the problem which I flag for the relativist, if I understood you correctly. That's, that's what I'm objecting to, uh -huh. be be because uh, what I'm pointing out has nothing to do w with the predicates of personal taste. So, th so the um, um, standard, the standard in the context of assessment, uh, can be taken out because we can remove uh, the uh, predicates of personal taste, uh, and you will see that that um, th there is no reading where we get different for the new ride and the local brew. So the problem with sameness of, of subject has nothing, has nothing to do with the predicates of personal taste. And that's what makes it problematic too. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I understand the problem. Um, I think we agree on the fact that there's multiple subjects 
No, um, and I think no, we in, do not. In, in your intend, in your intended reading, there are different subjects, uh -huh. and I think that that's not really an available reading Be because of the quantificational structure. Th there is, you have a, a, a verb phrase uh, which is infinitival. Yeah. Okay, so um, so for quantificational reasons, this seems wrong. Yeah. So here's the deal: if you presented, I've presented it to at least ten different English speakers, native English speakers. Um, they actually use two different perspectives. Um, so uh, maybe for like certain technical assumptions regarding quantification, this makes no sense. But then, I mean, the point is sort of clear. No, um, and then either I think there's something wrong with our approach to well, quantification. I'm not technically competent enough to respond to that, but maybe you can explain it to me later. Um, but I think these cases exist, where sort of the you know the perspectives go multiple ways rather than a single way. Well, that's an interesting result if you have done the test, um, and it would be interesting to find out what actually delivers that result. Uh, you could try out, for instance, I do the control test and take out the predicates of personal taste and see wha how people react then. Uh, as for number six, um, here uh, it's... Um, Um, it's also a bit difficult because as regards idiotic, that's a verdict of the speaker uh, and not uh, on some adjubutee that's mentioned in, in the sentence, while uh, delicious re refer is applied to the standards of taste of the kid. So I think that that's not exactly the kind of example you would want either. Well, <laughs> okay, so I, I think I'm, I'm missing on like a, a deep technical problem. Again, so what I'm hearing here is, okay, so we have two different perspectives. Idiotic is the speaker's perspective now, um, is relative to the speaker's perspective, and um, delicious to the, to the kids. Well, then, I think great, like for my case. Because you can't bind it to a single parameter in the in the circumstance of evaluation, but you can posit, mul posit multiple variables. And that way you don't have the problem. So you would say, you know, on Halloween every kid would either play an idiotic X trick on some adult or get a delicious Y treat. So okay, good. Different perspectives, no problem. Different variables. But if you have index binding, you just have X in the parameter, uh, in the circumstance, which stands for the kind of perspective lasers and ones. Yeah, you might, you might be right about... I, I think, I mean, yeah. Um. Like, if you, if you accept the intuition that there's multiple perspectives, I think whatever the technical details are, this is exactly the opposite of what lasers and ones. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure exactly what he would say about that, but you, you might be right about that. So let me just make sure I have this right. So there are follow-ups by Corinne and Francois. Have I missed anyone? No? Um, yes? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but I, th I mean, it's true that you sort of get the two, in the example uh, you just discussed with Peter, I mean, it's true that you get the two perspectives, but I thought you wanted... I thought, I thought you wanted the idiotic to go with the perspective of the adult. So it would be the adult in your example that would judge um, the trick to be idiotic, not the perspective of this people. I don't care. You know, like as oh, long, no, no, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> as long as there's multiple perspectives and y as long as, you know, you don't want to like just completely redo binding in the, 
in the circumstance of um, of evaluation. Sure. The more perspectives, the better. Okay, but I. Again, I'll give you another example. Every parent had brought a child to the restaurant, the wine was delicious, and so were the fish sticks. Okay? Sure. But on that example, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's that clear. But so can I just uh, quickly follow up? So I didn't understand the strength of the argument against Lasse Son here. I mean, are you suggesting that it's impossible to get a relativist semantics where you could have uh, different perspectives or different standards? Uh, uh, in the assessment context, or is it just ad hominem? Okay, Lasserson said, you know, there is just one standard in the context of assessment. He's wrong. It's not the end for relativists because they it's can. It's certainly not ad hominem. No, I mean, <laughs> it's not. I mean, I'm, I'm not just sort of attacking him for personal reasons or something. No, no, no. I mean, ad hominem. Like it's, his view, it's, it's his view, but it's not going to extend to a relativist who says, "Well, I'm just going to relax that requirement that there is only one standard." Um, of taste or whatever in the context of assessment, and then you can capture the sort of data you are putting forward. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, so I, first of all, I find it interesting that Lazerson, as a relativist, is trying to employ binding in his services now, because traditionally you would expect that it's sort of a contextualist argument. No? Now, if you read what Lazerson says is, you know, regarding our sentence, hang on, Every man gave some woman a fun ride and a tasty dish. No, where the two things come apart, he says, well, the intuition of the rel relativist sort of index binding procedure is this. In a relativist theory, in order to assess a sentence for truth or falsity, one must adopt a single stance. He doesn't say single, but that is, truth assessment is always done from a particular perspective and then he says, operators in the sentence may shift the perspective from which truth assessment is to be done, or quantify over such perspectives, and when they do so, the relevant perspective must be adopted for the entire scope of the operator. Okay? So I think, I think what he does... I, mean, I understand that, but I, I was just curious about whether you could imagine a relativist reply who says, well, we, we should just, you know... Drop that. Drop that. And maybe there is a way of being a relativist and capturing the fact that there are different standards of taste in the context of assessment. I don't see, uh, in principle, why we can't just, okay, that was, you know, okay, your, your examples are convincing, you know, the relativist has to say something else, and they could just, you know, uh, capture your data. I don't, I mean, mm. I haven't sort of thought it see, through, but okay. I don't see why they couldn't. The, um, you, you know, technically, you can probably make um, sense of that. Now, I, like, at least I couldn't argue against it, okay, because I don't have the technical competence. But then if you think about it philosophically, you know, so in principle, the kind of relativism I'm attacking is, like, or the problem I have with relativism is that you sort of sever the thin content from the circumstance. And now you come along and say, well, this really complicated um, binding thing, you know, which is set up by syntactic you know, structures is sort of interacting with a circumstance parameter, you know, so then this whole severing procedure, um, like in the beginning you say, well, as a relativist, well, thin semantic contents are independent, I mean, for example, McFarlane says, I don't know, of the circumstances, you know. So as soon as the binding is so incredibly complicated, I think you bring the two much closer together and it's no longer obvious why the content expressed is thin if it so strongly interacts with, you know, sort of sets up things in the parameters of the circumstances, um, and why we shouldn't just sort of consider the content, uh, the thin content, plus the circumstances as the proposition. But then we lose the relativist intuition, you know. Do you sort of see what, it, what I'm trying to say? So we have two more questions and five minutes to go so far. Okay, <coughs> so it's about the, the example with knowledge and the, the garage example. Uh, there are two things. First, I thought there, was, there were experiments by Hansen and Shemla showing that basically what philosophers had said about this shift of truth value actually happens and is attested by people's intuitions. So it seems that your results conflict with theirs, if I'm not wrong. And I wonder whether this may have to do with, at least from your presentation of the case, it doesn't seem that you gave much of the context to the people you test. Uh, 
you simply have Mary's or Sally's utterance, are you sure it hasn't been stolen in the meantime? But in the standard scenarios, there is, mo there is more than that. She says something like, there's been a lot of stealing of cars recently, and I saw some suspicious people in the vicinity, and so on and so forth. So then, indeed, you, you do change the context in a way that's sort of relevant to uh, induce this shift in truth value. So if you didn't provide that with, to, to, to your informants, maybe that's what would account for the difference with the results obtained by other people who actually use the full dress version. So that's one question, and another one is, you talked about polysemy in the other case, in the case of beautiful, but in subjective and objective sense. In the case of knowledge, maybe there is polysemy as well. Maybe there is one sense of certainty, and there is this other more effective sense, and maybe that might be relevant. Yeah, these are just both great suggestions. I'll, uh, I'll have to think about the latter and um, try out the former. No, no, no. I, I provided exactly what I what I have up here. You know, um, so the answer is no. I, you know, I don't have data on a on a deeper, like a more fleshed out um, shift in context. Oh, I'm sorry. My my question was just like Corinne, so I can pass. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Anyone? Yes. It's 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 just a suggestion. You, you, I don't know if you know, but uh, Joshua Novi and Steph Yalsen have done similar some similar experiments to the epistemic modal cases that you had here, and that's coming out somewhere <laughs> soon. But it's on on their pages. You can find that something on epistemic models and experimental data, and they've they've tested cases like the um, you know Bob might. Mike might be in Boston, uh, you know where he is, he might be in Boston, and then you, one of the interlocutors gets an email from saying that he's, he's at New York. Is that they New York? tested this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in touch, so we both, both sort of like in parallel started these things. Um, but they, interestingly, they do them quite differently, quite often. So, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the results, are basically the kind of results, if I can show you, they were similar to the retraction case you had, so they... Retraction is relatively easy because the, the results are relatively strong. Well, their, their, their retraction results were peculiar. It, oh, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't seem to confirm strongly either contextualist predictions or relativist predictions, which, so it, would, it seemed that it split more. So the judgment of the, the, the factual, say, John, say Bob is in Boston, and then you get an email saying that he's in New York. And then Bob might be in Boston. You get an email. So people people get very different uh, responses for those where you think it's false, when the factual assessment uh, a, a statement, or was it uh, Bob is in Boston? People say, well, if he's in New York, then that's just false. But he might might be, or when given the knowledge that you had back then, then people sort of st still thought that it came out true, even though. Uh, even though the, you later find out, or the speaker later finds out that that's not the case, that that is in New York, but the retraction cases that they had were cu were interesting cases, because they, I mean, they did not confirm the route with predictions, but they were not sort of strongly overwhelmed. So it seemed to, it seems that people, which is actually what I think, it seems that people <laughs> um, tend to think that pr retractions are permissible sometimes, but they're not mandatory, and that's that's problematic enough for for the relativist anyway. Yeah, but I mean, but if you're in touch in that with them, then yeah, so there's no point in <laughs> suggesting further. <laughs> so Thank so you. A very small final question, but really very short. Uh, I hope I can keep it short. I want, uh, may I see five again? Ah, uh, five. Okay. Here. So I think the idea was uh, what Peter uh, commented on was that so the right was uh, uh, taken by the kid right and the brew was taken by the father. So yes. there would be uh, this kind of joint uh, dependency on father and kid. And you might say that one prediction would be if it depends on both variables, uh, 
then uh, so I think it's called the contextualist option might say okay you depends on both and then they could get this shift in readings because then we have both parameters active at the same time and then it would predict well not a reading but the possibility that you know and this is theoretically maybe very strange but that the rights sometimes were fun for the father and sometimes for the kid and that the brood was uh, delicious sometimes for the father and sometimes for the kid and, and make it true and I think theoretically we would object to such a reading even though I think it would not be bad is okay so here the idea is that we we conceive of the two perspectives as a pair of perspectives yeah um, yeah I think I mean given that the children probably wouldn't find the brew delicious I mean as you say um, I, I don't find that a very appealing option okay so let's thank Marcus again and uh, we can take a 15 minute break and reconvene at 45 past sharp Thank you.